Okay, I see a lot of folks here, so we're going to get started. Welcome to the 17th annual COPD Education Day 2023, Emerging with Aloha. My name is Kathy Kozak. I'm an internal medicine doctor at Straub Medical Center and also on the board of directors of the Hawaii COPD Coalition. And I host the body show on Hawaii Public Radio, of which Val Chang, our illustrious leader, has been a guest several times. Thanks to all of you who are here today. Thanks to the folks who are new attendees and the folks who come every year. We hope you have a chance to visit with some of the exhibitors upstairs. They have some excellent exhibits and information available for everyone to see. They'll be here till about 1230. So for those of you who want to spend some more time afterwards, you'll be able to do that. We have a bit of a condensed program this year. Everybody will get a sandwich and you can eat it or drink it quietly while we're talking. And if it's not quiet, we'll notice. <laughs> we're very fortunate to have everyone here and uh, our speakers are fantastic. I'm always amazed at some of the information that I hear and even after being in practice for so many years, I learn something every single time. So today we're gonna hear first from Maya Alba and myself, we're gonna do something called Myth Busters. What are some of the common myths of COPD and what's the reality and the truth behind that? We also have Pamela McMillan, Valerie Chang, Erica Saito and Dr. Eric Crawley. This year we're accepting questions at the end of everyone's presentation and also on Zoom. So please put your questions in the chat. If you're on Zoom or if you're here, raise your hand and we will have someone bring you a microphone and we'll be able to have that question shared with everyone. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Bathrooms in the elevator are outside the auditorium, down the stairs to the right, parking. Make sure you parked legally, either Queens POB one or two, uh, if you don't, or valet, it's my fave. If you don't, there might be a heavy fine or towing or something like that. Validations are right outside, so make sure that if there's any question, you can ask some of our wonderful assistants and staff there. And if you did go ahead and get a hearing set, please make sure you return it and claim your ID. The Hawaii COPD, COPD Coalition also participates in Foodland's Give Aloha program and Amazon Smile. More information is available in your program. The Give Aloha program number is 78740 and is just this month of September only. So if you want some more additional information about donating, you can go to www.hawaiicopd.org. Now, first I'd like to introduce my favorite MythBuster friend, Zamira Alba is a nurse practitioner at Straub Lung Center, as well as the secretary of the Hawaii COPD Board of Directors. And she and I are gonna talk about MythBusters. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk a little bit about some things that you might hear about COPD. And then Maya's gonna help us to explain the truth or the lack thereof in some of the information that people might have heard. So before we get started, I wanted to actually have Maya explain what is COPD? What does it stand for and what does it mean? Maya, thanks for being here. Thank you. And thanks for sharing your information. Alrighty, so as a, um, this first slide, just talking about the first things about COPD. So C being chronic, so it's a daily, occurrence in people's lives and they live with it on a day-to-day -day basis and obstructive um, relates to the airflow that a person gets in their lungs and that it's quite limited and then pulmonary that's fancy name for lungs and that's where your airways are and then disease um, COPD is progressive it usually gets worse over time um, but the good news is uh, you know there's lots of things to manage and treat it Okay, so let's talk a little bit. How many people, and you don't have to raise your hand, think that you can have a diagnosis made just by your symptoms alone? Hmm. Maya, if somebody comes in and says they feel a little short of breath and they think they have it, is that the only way that we can diagnose COPD? 
No, actually, you have to have something called spirometry. But what happens a lot is that uh, uh, someone goes to their provider and says, oh, you know, I've been having trouble breathing and I'm coughing. And the provider thinks, oh, do you smoke? You must have COPD. They'll give them an inhaler and, you know, off you go. But really what needs to happen is that there needs to be something called a pulmonary function test um, and that we um, often do either at a provider's office at your you know, primary care, some, some of them do that there, but usually they go to a, a place where there's a pulmonologist and a lung center where they do more complete testing. Um, and sometimes when we're thinking of COPD, um, you know, we do other tests like blood work, checking blood glasses to make sure your carbon dioxide's okay. Um, sometimes there's a genetic disorder that causes COPD, so we'll do like genetic testing. Um, and then we also check patients' oxygen levels, because that's the one big thing that's making, you know, uh, that makes them feel like, you know, they are short of breath, and sometimes, yeah, they might have low oxygen level. And then, of course, we want to make sure it's not their heart. So sometimes we'll do EKGs, sometimes we'll do ultrasounds of their heart, make sure it's not a heart problem. And then also getting an image, right? Chest x-ray is one of the first things that we do. And then when we think there's something more suspicious, we'll get you know, a CT scan. Do you need to do all those tests or would some of them indicate that you might have COPD and that would give you enough information? We would do some of them first. And then, um, of course, it's so important to have a full evaluation and conversation about your symptoms, because sometimes, you know, if you have certain other symptoms, like if you have really bad liver disease and, COP and symptoms of COPD, we might, and you're really young, we might think, oh, maybe it's something genetic. So then for some of those patients, we'll do, you know, blood work. So I just don't want people to feel like that big long list they have to do immediately all at once. But there's a sequence, and as you mentioned, step by step, some of those tests will be done and it'll help to pinpoint exactly what condition we're dealing with. Now you mentioned that sometimes a provider will say, oh, this patient is a smoker. So if you never smoked, can you get COPD? A lot of people think maybe I'm not a smoker, why would I get it? Hmm. Yeah, so the truth is, well, yes, smoking and COPD, like 80% of people with COPD, you know, are, you know, considered smokers, former smokers, but there's a good 10 to 20% where it's from other things, like secondhand smoke actually affects people, um, workplace dust, we have patients who work in the shipyard, things like that, who are exposed to certain fumes or even cooks. Um, because also, you know, um, wood burning stoves, things like that, that could affect your lungs. Um, and then of course, what I mentioned before is like genetics, very uncommon, but it is something that does cause COPD. Next slide. Okay. So you don't necessarily have to be a smoker. You could have other occupational or environmental exposures. Now, when we think about it, is having a cough normal? Some people say, you know, I have a little cough and it's because I'm a smoker and that's normal and all my friends who are smokers have a cough. And is that necessarily something that everybody should be having on a regular basis? No. <laughs> so a lot of the times patients will come in and say, oh, I just have a cough. It's just my smoker's cough. That's not normal. <laughs> you shouldn't have a smoker's cough. So it's really important that you um, talk to your provider about your symptoms. Um, you know, yes, it could be short of breath, the shortness of breath that you're having, uh, but a lot of times patients will also have additional symptoms like wheezing, um, a lot of mucus production. Um, and then they could say, oh, I, I'm having recurrent colds. They call, oh, I just have a cold. I need an antibiotic. Or I always have bronchitis. Well, you might be, you know, need to be worked up and, and, and be diagnosed with COPD so we could properly treat you instead of just giving you, here's a pack. okay, on your way. <laughs> we don't want that. Well, and it kind of brings up the idea that sometimes for folks who get episodic care, where they don't see their regular provider or they don't see their lung specialist, if every time you have your cough, you go to an urgent care or you do, you do something where you just take a course of antibiotics, you might be missing the underlying diagnosis. And that becomes one of the issues that, particularly if you have a regular provider, they're able to help identify that based on your symptoms. Because unfortunately, I think I've been 
definitely guilty of what Maya said, which is, oh, you have a cough. It must just be a bronchitis. Take your z pack and you'll be fine. And in fact, there's something else going on. So as a guilty person myself, I think it's very important that providers ask, but also that patients make sure they see somebody and explain the duration and frequency of their symptoms so they don't have that outcome just like you mentioned. Now, antibiotics are one way that if you have an acute infection, you might need to be treated, but that's certainly not the only way. And sometimes there are things that can be helpful that you can do to help with your COPD. Now, one of the things that people wonder is, are inhalers the only treatment for COPD? So we know that certain inhalers do a lot of good, but is that all you got? Is there anything else out there? No, and as you'll learn today a little later on, um, there are a lot of advanced treatments as well for COPD, but the biggest thing is to um, get a diagnosis early. So when you do have those symptoms and, and bringing it up to your provider, because yes, they'll give you an inhaler, but there's also um, oral medications that we give for patients with COPD, um, supplemental oxygen. Um, a lot of the times patients get um, oxygen when they're hospitalized and they go home and they need oxygen. Uh, but it's really important for us to identify that, you know, when they're already, you know, out in the community. Um, and then of course, we'll learn later uh, from Erica about pulmonary rehab, which is a great thing for patients with COPD. And we're so blessed to have one here in um, town and on island um, that patients could go to. Um, and then, you know, also there's, um, for more severe cases too, there's also lung transplants. Um, unfortunately, they would have to go off island to get that done, but at least it's something that we consider, um, and we've certainly sent patients for that and have done really well. Um, and then, of course, lifestyle changes for COPD. When you get diagnosed, you want to make sure that you, number one, quit smoking, but that you stay active and that you eat, you know, right, and have a healthy uh, weight. You know, I was listening to this podcast the other day, and the interesting question was, what are the side effects of a healthy diet and good exercise? And I thought, no, nothing bad. All of it's good. So it was interesting because the next question was, what are the side effects of antibiotics and some of the other treatments? A much longer list. So you mentioned trying to do the right things for your health in general, and that's absolutely something we want to encourage people to do. Zero risk in exercise and dieting and, and doing all those other healthy things that we know we should do. And I'm guilty, not always do we do them. Now, I think we had a question in the back. So if we can get a microphone to our gentleman in the back, he, had to, he wanted a question, and we'll be happy to answer it. Say it loud, and we'll repeat it. Please. Yeah, maybe we could add under the truth also nebulization medications for those patients as well. Yes. Just a thought. <laughs> no, absolutely. No. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Nebulized medications, 100%. Yeah. When inhalers may not get you enough medication, sometimes getting a more direct route of that can really be helpful. And I've seen you suggest that for some of the patients that we share that don't necessarily do as well with inhalers. So thank you for that. And absolutely, 100%. And then... Um, uh, speaking on that too, is later on, if you haven't already gone to the exhibit upstairs, um, the respiratory therapist um, students did an amazing job showing all the different types of inhalers and nebulizer devices and also um, things like pulmonary clearance devices um, that they could show you so you could have a hands-on feel. Because a lot of times when you do get inhalers or get prescribed a nebulizer, uh, nobody shows you. Like the pharmacists are so busy, they don't show you how to use these. And sometimes too, like the providers, they don't show you how to use your inhalers. Um, so go up there. That's a really good point. I remember when I first started seeing patients, I started to ask them to demonstrate how they were using their inhaler. And, you know, the hard part for me was, what was I going to do to tell them how to use it correctly? But I learned that one of the most important things you could do is ask a patient to demonstrate how they use their inhaler. Now, sometimes in doctor's offices prior to COVID, we actually had a little, what would be called just sort of a sample inhaler with no medicine in it. But just even asking them to demonstrate how they would do it. I had one patient I will never forget. Within the first six months of practice, her way of using the inhaler was to spray it all around and then 
gulp at the air. Now, honestly, no one ever told her otherwise, so it certainly wasn't her fault. But when I looked at why she was going through her inhalers so much, it was because no one really had taken the time to explain to her proper usage. So for anybody who either is in the educational area on inhaler use, and this might be the thousandth time that they've told someone to use an inhaler, remember, it's that person's first time. And when I got sick a while back, I had to use an inhaler, and I have to tell you, all those years of telling patients how to do it, I knew not to spray it around myself, but I also really wasn't that coordinated, I have to tell you. It's more difficult than just, hey, just do this and puff. There's a lot more that goes into it. So I was humbled by my own ignorance when I tried to do it myself. So definitely working on inhaler use. And then you brought up a great comment about nebulizers, because if you really can't coordinate, or people who might have a tremor, or they might not have the ability to hold up their hand and, and squeeze with their fingers, Arthritis can affect this as well. They may benefit from using something stronger like a nebulizer, and that may be a better treatment option for them. So looking at your patients and finding out can they use an inhaler, but then also assessing maybe it's just a physical issue that they can't use the inhaler effectively and they need to use something else. So that's where nebulizers come in, and I've certainly seen you recommend to that to patients in the past. Now the next myth, when you go on oxygen, you gotta stay on it forever. True, false? It's false. Well, for some people. Um, so a lot of um, pushback I get when I tell a patient, oh, we're gonna just check your oxygen level and make sure you don't you know, need oxygen. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa I don't wanna start that because then I'll never get off of it. Um, but sometimes, you know, patients are on it just temporarily if they're um, having an acute uh, exacerbation um, or sometimes patients just need it when they're sleeping. Um, and certainly with air travel, um, and then um, as far as having more severe COPD, those patients, yes, when they're end stage severe, they've been living with it for sometimes decades, um, yeah, they could eventually be on oxygen and need it 24 hours, you know, when they're at rest, when they're walking, um, and when they're sleeping. Um, but certainly I have plenty of patients, and many patients usually start with an as needed oxygen or just at bedtime or just when they're traveling um, on, you know, and going in higher elevations. Now we're gonna talk about travel and oxygen in just a few moments, but when you start people on oxygen, do you generally start them on sort of a heavy, like I see these green tanks, or are there now some easier portable ways? Because I think one of the issues with patients not wanting to necessarily start on oxygen. There's a fear of not getting off of it. There's also the, the fear of how do I stay tethered to something all the time? Is it heavy? Can I push it? How do I manage that? What are some of the different oxygen delivery devices that you might recommend for some of your patients? Yeah. So this green one up here is very common. It's called an E-tank. It's usually about like three two and a half feet tall, uh, but they actually have um, uh, tanks that are much smaller. So I have a lot of patients who golf and do other things and they're like, I don't wanna be rolling you know, my oxygen tank with me. Um, so in the beginning we say no, they come in small sizes, even five pounds, you could get a carrying case. Um, and for some patients who need um, uh, oxygen um, throughout the day, because they're very active, they actually have portable oxygen concentrators that last much longer as well and are you know, pretty much five pounds um, or lighter. Okay, so you can use it if you need to. Now we wanna get some questions from the audience, either in here personally, or if there are any on the chat, please let us know. We're open to any and all questions. Actually, Maya is open to any and all questions, and I will just announce them and let her answer those. Is there any on the chat or anything? No? That's okay, too. <laughs> I think she's relieved. Well, I want to thank you for sharing 
all of your expertise with us. You do a great job taking care of patients and also helping to explain to them ways to handle their diagnosis and ways to help live a healthy lifestyle and enjoy themselves, even if they do have a condition like COPD. Thanks very much. Oh, wait, we had a question. The questions are coming. You thought you were off. You're not. Can we get a microphone towards the back? That's perfect. Sorry, I had a quick question. What would you consider a COPD-friendly diet? A COPD-friendly diet? Yeah, is there such a thing? Or? Um, there is some patients ask me, oh, should I go with an anti-inflammatory diet? Like if you Google that, whole sorts of things comes up, like avoiding, um, you know, artificial sugars, a lot of carbs, um, nightshades, things like that. Um, if you refer to our Hawaii COPD um, website, we actually had um, one of the, was it she pulmonologist that was also nutrition specialist that talks about a COPD, COPD diet. Um, also other things like adding like turmeric anti-inflammatory to your um, diet. That's a really good thing. Garlic is another good anti-inflammatory. But you just want to be careful because sometimes, you know, if a patient has like acid reflux or certain things, um, you don't want to just follow what you see online or the diet, you know, wanting to talk to your healthcare provider if this is right for you. But pretty much trying to have a um, healthy um, diet as consisting of like, you know, vegetables, right? And fruits and not artificial sweeteners and a lot of, you know, carbs. Okay, I got to ask, what's a nightshade and why do I eat those? <laughs> like an eggplant or bell pepper, um, but a nightshade refers to how the, um, the, the flowering plant looks like. It looks like a shade of a lamp, and then if the fruit comes from it, um, it, it looks like it's coming from a nightshade. <laughs> All right, because I've always wondered. So it's an eggplant. Got it. Eggplant. Bell pepper. <laughs> Bell pepper. It's a nightshade. Okay. See, I told you I learned something new every year. All right. We have another question in the back. Yes. Um, going back to the myth that related to, um, I think it was, can you only get COPD from smoking? So then you listed like other arenas. Um, I noticed that this year in the gold 2023 report, huge update, a lot of updates within that report. Um, they're looking now more at, um, I think they called them um, taxonomy of COPD. So they did like a breakdown. Are you guys kind of following that mode of thinking, if you will, um, in your like facility? Um, it usually comes from when we meet the person for the first time and do a consultation. Yeah, we ask all sorts of things like, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Were you exposed to any pesticides? We have, I have a, a funny story with a lot of patients where they're like, no, I lived out in the country and the farm. Well, what did you do, you know, for fun? Oh, we would run after the pesticide trucks. <laughs> so, and a lot of the times, you know, that would eventually affect them. So yeah, asking certain things, because it's not all about smoking. Um, sometimes when patients live next to a coal plant, you know, um, those are some of the patients that, you know, we need to know, like, uh, where you live or, or what kind of building do you live in? Is there water damage? You know, things like that. So does that answer your question, kind of? Oh, and then Dr. Crowley, you have a question? <laughs> Yeah, and in that same vein, um, it's really interesting to talk a little bit about indoor um, uh, exposures that can contribute to COPD. And globally, um, although smoking still is the primary one, one of the things that may be under-recognized is uh, indoor cooking, especially um, uh, people who do a lot of frying. So if you look at Asia, and particularly in, tai in Taiwan, there was literature looking at uh, you know, using a, a exposure to walks as a risk factor for lung cancer. So we know that a lot of obstructive lung disease can be related to just normal household activities we might not really think about, so such as indoor, indoor wood-fired cooking or frying. That's absolutely an excellent point. When you're cooking your nightshades, you know, you, you have walk. to make sure you walk. 
that you're not frying it and then inhaling all the air. But truthfully, there are epidemics of this in some of the developing countries. Dr. Carly, you mentioned Taiwan, one of the countries that has studied this. But when you look at some developing countries throughout Southeast Asia or even throughout the world where they cook and it's indoors, you may have a tiny little ventilation, little opening at the top, but you know, not always does that get rid of enough smoke. So it's a very astute observation. And yeah, I appreciate the question and also the input from Dr. Carly on the answer. Any other questions or thoughts that people have? We've still got some more speakers, so there's going to be plenty of time if something else comes up. Thank you, Maya, for all that you do. Thank you for having me. Next, we're going to have a discussion of something that will show my age. I remember years ago, a song, Should I Stay or Should I Go? I think it was by an English punk rock band, and I am not going to sing it because I do not hate the audience. <laughs> All right, so we are going to have Pamela McMillan. She's a respiratory expert at Kaiser Permanente, Kaiser Permanente and also a board member of the Hawaii COPD Coalition, as well as Valerie Chang. She's a patient advocate founder of the Hawaii COPD Coalition, and both of them travel a lot, including trips since the COVID pandemic. So we are going to hear a talk about should I stay or should I go now? Mahalo, Kathleen, and, and welcome everyone to the 17th annual COPD Day. Um, we are here, Val Chang and I. Val Chang has led the COPD Coalition um, for so many years, and we are so grateful to Val um, and myself. I work at Kaiser. I am the one in the pulmonary lab doing the spirometry testing, and I see a lot of COPD patients. Um, and uh, we first want to disclose that we have no conflicts of interest. We are not... Um, here, you know, have no conflicts to any uh, companies. Um, I do fly monthly um, for Kaiser to the Outer Islands. Um, I flew all through pandemic and I have traveled through the world. And Valerie has also um, uh, traveled just recently, most recently to Japan and to, um, has flown 30,000 miles with oxygen and has been traveling internationally since 2008. Um, so, yeah. okay. our objectives are to increase your understanding, both the patients and students and healthcare professionals, of the processes and potential challenges for patients that require oxygen when you travel, especially by airplane. And we want to increase your confidence um, so that you know, both patients and healthcare professionals um, in discussing how to travel and how to plan appropriately to, to do these things. Um, so we just want to make sure that um, given that we are in this COVID-19, you know, still ongoing uh, pandemic, um, that the CDC does recommend all people with serious chronic medical conditions such as COPD and any lung disease heart disease or diabetes, that you do discuss travel with your health care provider before you make these plans. And these patients are at higher risk, COPD patients especially, are at higher risk for serious illness from COVID-19 or possibly because of your age. Um, and we don't want you to end up with serious long-term health um, you know, problems. So do check in with your health care provider. Um, you know, before you make any plans. So, um, you know, one thing is uh, to consider travel insurance. Um, that is something that some credit cards do cover, and you could possibly um, avoid, you know, expensive things. And if you uh, book through your tra your credit card that has travel insurance. Um, and check if they, they, you know, want you to avoid any pre-existing conditions before you go traveling. Um, most importantly, if you are going to travel with oxygen, 
you have to know that you cannot take tanks on airplanes and you need to have a, a POC, a POC or a personal oxygen concentrator that meets the FAA requirements. Um, and you need to plan for the time and disruptions and time it takes you to make these journeys. As we all know, um, flights are delayed and things can happen. So batteries are essential. I know we have had patients show up at Kaiser from Outer Islands with dead batteries or with, um, you know, concentrators that are not working and things like this. So planning ahead is essential and you need 50% more battery time than what your expected transit time is supposed to be. That's what's recommended. Um, you do need to check with the airlines and each specific airline has requirements and paperwork. I see our nurses um, filling out the Hawaiian airline forms for our patients all the time um, regarding oxygen. Um, so the, there is some paperwork involved depending on the airline. Um, there are certain things if you are flying and you're not sure how you will do when you go on a trip, there is some testing that can be done. So um, specifically one test is called the HAST test. And we actually do not do this at Kaiser, but I believe they do it at Straub and at Tripler, I believe. Um, so that's a high altitude simulation test um, where you're actually tested to see how you're going to do on, in an airplane. Um, the other thing to do would be to put your, put an oximeter on your finger and um, you can somewhat do that on an airplane yourself, but a half test does it here on the ground before you go up in the airplane. Um, so if you were to check your saturation on room air, um, you can do that, which is putting the little clamp on your finger. Or we can do a six-minute walk test with you. That's another test um, different than the HAST test. And more, it's more commonly given at all the hospitals. HAST is something that your doctor might have to recommend out. You also might want to talk with your provider and have everything ready in case there's an emergency. At times when I have taken my family, I took my family to the elephant camps. My kids were young. We went to Thailand and we made sure we had some antibiotics, some of my asthma meds and, you know, things just in case. In today's world, you might want to ask your doctor for a, some Paxlovid, um, which is the, what we use for COVID possibly a Z-Pak, some um, antibiotic, prednisone. Always have your masks ready and COVID tests um, and anything, any doses. And obviously they don't want you to put it in your checked in bag. They tell you that on the, you know, before you go on the airplane. So, um, oh, okay. <laughs> So we have some um, questions. We can't get our next slide to work, but um, we just want the, the question would be, how could a part patient determine that they need supplemental oxygen? And um, the one test that we would do would be that test I talked about called the high altitude simulation test. Um, done at Straub or at, um, or at uh, Tripler. The other thing would be to use your own oximeter and, and take it up with you if you were, let's say, driving up to the mountain. You can watch your own uh, saturation on an oximeter. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, Val, would, would a pulmonary function test help us um, determine whether altitude, you know, you could tolerate altitude. Um, pulmonary yes test and no, or no, I think. It, it, it gives you a clue if the patient tends to have a higher lung function, they tend to have more things working right. And patients like me that have lower pulmonary function tests might need more help. But it, it's not definitive. Right, 
Right, so it's not exactly looking entirely at oxygenation, which is... Actually, the next thing yeah. to ask that question. So, <laughs> Should we go? Yeah, so does a patient, uh, if a patient doesn't need oxygen normally and can maintain their, their level above 90% during a six-minute walk, are they okay to go with oxygen? Well, we'll flip to the next slide. <laughs> and... Um, there is an article. Yeah, so there are articles um, regarding this uh, from the ERS um, that if your resting oxygen is, is over 95 on a six-minute walk um, and greater than 84 percent, um, that you may be fit to fly. Um, so it isn't just the Haas test, right? It can be, it could be done, you know, with a, with a six-minute walk, I guess. Um, so, again, um, another question would be on spirometry, if we saw an FEV1 of 30%, is it okay? Can they, can they fly? That's not really enough. I think yeah. really you need to to explore further. So it's not, it's more, we want to look at oxygenation, not at, at just an FEV1, FEV1, anything of 30% would not be good. So um, that's not correct. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so I think a lot of times, especially since we live on Oahu, we forget there's so many other ways to get around. and. A lot of times we don't really think about going by train or going by boat or going by bus. But those are actually a lot of easier ways for people, especially if they're, they live on the mainland, where they can get from one place to the other without needing as much oxygen. And if they don't need oxygen where they live and they're not going to increase their elevation, you know, they can talk to Amtrak and see what their requirements are and whether that might meet their needs better. So I do know friends that have traveled, and we have traveled by Amtrak, and they're usually pretty good about letting you take on your portable oxygen concentrator, which we do have in room 201, and the respiratory therapists, respiratory therapy students will be happy to let you look at them. Um, there are rules, though, so you need to check with the, the cruise company, the uh, train company, the bus company, to find out what their rules are with regard to taking any equipment you may need on your travels. Um, if you are flying, each airline has the right to have you fill out whatever forms they need you to fill out and make sure you give yourself enough time. I always check the form before I buy the ticket so that I'm not surprised and don't make my doctors too crazy. Um, wheelchairs, even if you don't normally use them, can be very helpful because it allows you to save your energy and save your breath because it does take exertion to be pushing your suitcase all over some of these really large airports and especially if you have to rush from one gate to another for a connection. The wheelchair can spend the, the pusher of the wheelchair can spend their energy instead of you spending yours and using up all your battery for your portable concentrator. Um, as uh, Pam said, make sure all your medicines and your equipment is within reach. Don't have it above your, in the overhead compartment where you can't get to it because they might tell everyone to stay seated because there's turbulence or whatever. Just make sure it's handy. Um, and your batteries cannot be checked. They all have to be carried on, even if you carry four batteries like I do. Um, you can't have bulkhead seats, and you can't have exit, exit row seats. And usually, the flight attendants are happiest if you sit in a window seat if you have oxygen because they don't want you to trip other passengers with your tubing. Um, and a very 
rarely discussed tip is if you call the accessibility or disabilities desk right after you book your ticket and ask them, they will be happy to help you find a seat closer to the front of the plane so you don't have to schlep all your stuff as far back on the plane. And it can be very helpful to you and your companion. Um, and your, uh, your medical equipment never counts as luggage. So if you have to bring a portable concentrator and you have to bring medicines, those are not counted as luggage. You still get your other luggage that you normally get to bring on the plane. Oh, sorry, also don't ever count on being able to use any outlets to charge your portable concentrator. They draw too much um, electricity and will not charge your concentrator. Um, no, that's the wrong way, sorry. Okay, and you can rent or purchase a concentrator. Um, there are some upstairs in room 201 that the wonderful respiratory therapy students will be happy to show you. Um, there's also one that is on toward the back of this um, booklet that you got when you registered. And it is the new machine that I am going to get sometime later this month. It's six and a half pounds and it does two liters continuous flow as well as of course the lighter flow rates. So that might be a really nice option for people that are looking for a lighter machine. Um, and your provider can tell you whether you need continuous flow and at what rate. And especially if you need oxygen to sleep like I do, it's really important to make sure that whatever machine you're planning to use will meet your needs for sleep. Usually they do recommend that we sleep with continuous flow because that gives you oxygen all the time instead of only when you inhale hard enough. Okay. Okay, the second question is, how can patients get supplemental oxygen on the plane? And then these are all the different answers. And does anyone have any thoughts? Otherwise, we'll just skip ahead and tell you the answer. So, I'll ask, oh, I don't, I'll ask you the question, uh, Val. So, um, can I just call the airline and, and tell them I need oxygen and pay them? Once upon a time, that's how all airlines did it. They would not allow you to bring your own oxygen on the plane. But in 2008, um, FAA changed the rule because there were too many patients in 2007 over Thanksgiving that needed oxygen. And they got very concerned that it would be, create a medical emergency that there were all these stranded patients and they were all running out of oxygen. So after that, they said, you know, patients will be in charge of their own oxygen. Okay, so that is our next question. Is the patient, um, can the patient bring their own filled oxygen tanks on a plane? In the United States, they do not allow any of us to bring filled oxygen tanks, and that's a long story we won't go into. My long story is I can't even get ox tanks from Maui over to Moanalua or for, you know, vice versa, from Moanalua to over to our clinics in Wailuku if I had a calibration gas problem, which we came up, it did come up in um, pandemic where we were, our gas supplies and our supply chain issues, um, we were running short on, and you can't even fly a tank over like of calibration gas, so that would be a no. Um, you cannot bring tanks. They have to go on the barge. They have to go with a special fees. As Kaiser found out uh, through, I think, Container Corporation, we had special cargo that would deliver our gas. So no tanks. It's considered hazardous material. So it's, yeah, definitely subject to all kinds of rules. Okay, so the next uh, question would be, can a patient contract with an independent vendor who supplies the portable oxygen concentrator? Yes, yeah, some airlines have vendors they prefer, but almost any um, 
airline is happy if you want to go find your own uh, person, only company that you want to rent from. But make sure that they support whatever product they're going to loan out or rent out because you don't want to get stuck with something that doesn't meet your needs. Does the TSA supply oxygen at any fee? No, they do not. They will not help you. You have to figure this out on your own. Well, the good thing about TSA is they're now getting more familiar with us bringing portable concentrators. The first few times I used them in 2008 and 2009, it took a really long time for them to figure out what I was bringing through the equipment, but now they're more cavalier and they just Make sure they test. They don't it. think it's a bomb. They don't think yeah. she's a terrorist anymore. But they do test for gunpowder residues. Oh, yeah. They always double check on that. So just allow extra time. Okay. Okay. Um, some people are under the mistaken opinion that your your company that gives you oxygen is required to help give you stuff for traveling. And that's not actually true. I mean, most companies will try to help you, but some of them are more helpful than others. And they can help you find a company at your destination, and they can help you here and there. But you got to give them enough time, because they have other people that might also be traveling. Um, and also, their supply chain, they've been having supply chain issues too since, of, since COVID because more people are on supplemental oxygen, especially if they have a bad infection. So you might have problems with that. So the longer lead time you can give everyone, the better. Um, so this is the last thing that I plan to talk about is just all the things that we just it's just a summary of what we already talked about. And then the other thing we have is, whoops, sorry. Hello. We're really good at this. Well, I, I just wanted to say as someone who has, I traveled a lot bringing my kids into parts of the world that people don't usually bring their kids into before the pandemic. Um, it's just, yeah, there are good travel days and bad travel days. So you do have to pack your sense of humor. Um, with you and patience and plan ahead. Planning is essential. I think when I traveled in pandemic, it was the first time that all of the training I had as an RT, very strict training at UCSF. I worked in the neonatal intensive care unit, and I, don't, I think they were about the most protective nurses in the whole wide world. You could not touch an isolate unless you had gone through a process I would liken to the McKinley car wash through you know, getting your scrubs on and everything and scrubbing into that unit. You were not allowed in any other unit or outside the cafeteria at all unless you had re-scrubbed back into the neonatal ICU. I really learned what good hand washing was because if you went to touch the isolate, you had the charge nurse yelling at you, what do you think you're doing? You missed this or that step of the McKinley car wash. Like my hoop earring was out of the, the scrub cap or something like this. So those became very important skills in the pandemic. You know, I, I, for the first time in my life, I thought I might die from going to work, you know? So I really learned what good hand washing was and how to not be aerosolized. And I don't care if everyone on the plane is not wearing a mask. I am still gonna put mine on. I feel no peer pressure whatsoever from wearing my mask on the plane. It's what has saved my life, I think, is masking up and those protective measures of making sure that I consider my mucous membranes the isolate. I am not gonna touch anything out there to my mucous membrane until I have thoroughly cleaned or sanitized my hands. And these are things that I feel have helped me you know, in this pandemic. Once I understood those rules and practiced those rules, I was not afraid anymore of 
you know, getting COVID. So one thing that people always ask is how do you tell a good mask from a junk mask? And there are the, the best, I, I am not an engineer, so I like to rely on engineers. And the last resource I have on the, this resource slide is Aaron Collins. And he is a mechanical engineer and he tested literally hundreds of masks for breathability and also how protective they are. So I think it's better not to reinvent the wheel. So I've cited him and I'll put his, uh, this resource slide on our website so that if anyone's interested, they can follow up on it because having a bad mask to me just gives you a false sense of security. And so I think wearing a mask allowed me to travel and be more confident that I was not exposing myself more than necessary. Just anecdotally, we saw a very creative, breathable mask at Kaiser one day. The patient had creatively stapled a, a piece of paper towel and put a piece of screen in the front so he could breathe better. And he got by the front door like that. So I just thought of that breathable mask that was homemade. Check. Okay, so I guess we have a question in the chat. Yeah, can you read the question in the chat? Please. And um, if it's not a question, it's more so. It just says the song is by the Clash. <laughs> the what? The song. Oh, oh, yeah. Should, should I stay or should I go? It was the okay. Cure. I don't remember. Uh, it, uh, are there any questions in the audience? We're done, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Anybody have anybody have questions about traveling? There's a huge, I just want to say like, there's a huge thing staying in one place, cruise lines, you know, that, that traveling train in Napa where you're not always moving from one hotel to the other. I learned that with a bunch of kids, traveling with a bunch of kids is way easier to not go from one hotel to another. Yeah, and actually, I when we were traveling with one tour company, they, the tour leaders tested every other day and everyone on the tour had to wear a mask. And as far as I know, no one on our tour got sick. We were in Japan. We were traveling for about 10 days. And so <coughs> I think that there's a lot to be said for wearing good masks. Thank you very much. I wear my N100 all the time, the N95 with the other one over it. <laughs> Okay, I want to thank both of you, both Pamela McMillan and Valerie Chang for helping us to understand what sort of things do we need to think about when we travel. And yes, it was by the clash and I can hear it in my head, but that would not be what would come out of my mouth. So I will let everyone else YouTube the clash. So thank you for those helpful tips and tricks to help us if we continue traveling safely and emerge with Aloha, Pam and Valerie. Now we're gonna learn more about the treatment that helps nearly everybody with and without lung disease. Doesn't add to your bill. I need to do more of it. This is a talk by Erica Saito. She is a physical therapy expert at the Rehab Hospital of the Pacific, and she's talking about pulmonary rehab and exercise. Get ready to move. Come on up. Okay, hello. Um, I sometimes tend to talk soft, so if people cannot hear me, just wave and I'll get closer to the mask. Uh, the mask, um, the mic. <laughs> okay, so I work at Rehab Hospital. Um, I actually see a lot of Maya's patients. Uh, it's quite lovely. And here we go. Oops. Okay, so the objectives for today, we're gonna learn and understand how to track your vitals while exercising. Learn various breathing techniques to improve strength, endurance, and motor control. 
learn how to use an interferometer device for optimal performance at home, and then understand some energy conservation techniques and how to apply them to your daily life. Also with that, we're gonna perform some seated exercises, more like stretches, to improve thoracic mobility and breathing. Okay. So, super important. Um, I track these three things when I'm working with patients and I always tell them, if you're gonna be exercising at home or when you should be exercising at home, these are the three things you wanna be looking at. So, oh, sorry about the spacing. But number one, oxygen. Number two, heart rate. And number three, it's rate of perceived exertion. So that's a subjective scale that we will be talking about later. Okay, so how to measure oxygen. A lot of uh, us are gonna be using the pulse oximeter. You can get that on Amazon or CVS. Um, oh, spacing is very odd. Anyway, um, first thing that it's gonna measure is oxygen levels, SpO2, and then heart rate on the side. Some patients come in and they actually don't know that it tracks both. And so I have to talk to them, kind of like how you guys were talking about demonstrating uh, the use of an inhaler, sometimes we have to demonstrate this as well. Um, good oxygen levels, 95% and above. Um, bad oxygen levels are actually 88 and below. That's what we're looking at. And then the next one, heart rate. So also measured by the pulse oximeter. Um, normal resting heart rate, I tell patients, is about 60 to 100. They frequently ask me what normal is. And then basically I tell them when we're measuring we don't wanna see like jumps all the way to like 120 suddenly. Um, so that's basically what I'm looking out for. The third thing is the rate of perceived exertion scale. I have a lot of printouts of this for patients so they can take that home. Um, not today, but I give them out. Basically when we're exercising, patients want to be within the four through six level. Um, the reason why we measure all three is because I could be talking to a patient and I could be looking at their vitals and they look totally fine, heart rate and oxygen, but they're at an eight and I actually don't know that. Uh, so I ask them frequently throughout the exercises. Vice versa, they could be at a one and they're just talking and they're totally fine, but their oxygen levels are at like 88, 85. They don't know because that's their normal. Um, so also taking a look at that. Vice versa, the heart rate could just be spiking and they also don't know that. So we're all tracking numbers all three. Um, very important part also is I tell patients to make sure they're tracking their vitals at home for two minutes after they stop exercising. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm done exercising, I'm just gonna take it off. Uh, the reason why that is is because you'll actually see more of the spikes the moment you stop exercising and that's also what I use to see if they're recovering well and fast recovery, so it doesn't take them like two to three minutes to recover, it takes them like 30 seconds later on to recover, and that's actually great. So, moving on, so these are some of the breathing techniques that I work with patients on. They're, they're pretty basic, but it's actually difficult. Um, the first breathing technique is three-dimensional breathing. A lot of people say, oh, I'm gonna learn uh, deep diaphragmatic breathing, and I'll call it that sometimes, but I'll explain why uh, three-dimensional breathing is good and important. Uh, that's the baseline technique. The second technique is pursed lip breathing. So pursed lip breathing we use for during exercise, shortness of breath, and calming. The third is paper breathing. So it works very well with patients who um, need to see what their breath is like, how the strength and endurance of it. And then the fourth is straw breathing. So that's more of a level one resistance type of training that I use with patients. And then number five is ratio breathing. So very good for motor control and also calming, um, especially in those anxiety, panic-like states. So going over the first one, three-dimensional breathing is a little bit different than deep diaphragmatic breathing. A lot of people think deep diaphragmatic breathing is gonna be only belly breathing. So a lot of people say, oh, I do yoga and uh, I know all about this type of breathing, but it's a little different. We want both chest and belly expansion. So I usually have patients put their hand on their chest and hand below their belly button. So if anyone wants to join in, you can do so. Um, most of the time I have patients sit at the edge of their chair. So they're not leaning back because a lot of people will do this instead. So edge of their chair, one hand on your chest, one hand below your belly button, and I have them take a deep breath in. So what I'm looking for is both here and here expand, expanding. A lot of people will have just chest breathing and or just belly breathing. Um, most times people who have breathing issues will use their secondary breathing muscles up here and they'll just be doing this. 
Um, so the reason why we want to see both is because the diaphragm, top left corner, is attached to all the lower ribs. And so we want that to expand this way. And then we want belly to also expand so diaphragm can drop down. So that's how you're going to get really good expansion so that lower lobes of the lungs can actually inflate and deflate. Alrighty, so that's the baseline technique that we tend to, excuse me, that we tend to use. Um, and then purse lip breathing, it'll just be the addition of making your lip really tight into an O shape. So when you're inhaling through your nose, you'll slow it down to about two counts. And then when you're exhaling, you're going to exhale through your lips, kind of like shooting out water is what I tell patients and or blowing out a candle that's like 50 feet away. People will try to blow out a candle that's like right here um, and it's not really going anywhere. The other thing to look out for that I really watch is a lot of patients throat breathe. And so kind of what that sounds like is uh, they'll go like this and that's their normal breathing pattern. Um, that they think they're breathing out really hard and really it's just tightening of the throat muscles and tightening of the chest and they're shooting pressure downward. So they're actually like kind of feeling like they're compressing their diaphragm. Um, so that's something I watch out for. And purse lip breathing can actually help decrease some of that um, throat breathing because it'll change the pattern of compression here to actually to the lips. So they'll shoot it out instead of compress it here. Uh, the third technique that I actually use a lot more is paper breathing because it's a visual technique for patients. Also, same thing, decreases their ability to throat breathe because then they actually have to see the paper move. Now, I'll demonstrate here um, a little bit of paper breathing. If I did throat breathing, this is how the paper would move. It doesn't go anywhere. And so people... Uh, patients will be like, no, I'm breathing really hard. And I'm like, yes, uh, that's true, but it's not actually, you're not shooting the air out. So they'll go to their PFT test and be like, I tried my hardest, so, you know, like I did this. <sighs> and they're like, I, it didn't move. Um, so I'll tell them, okay, let's sit down and let's try this. And so I'll hold the paper in front of them. I don't really like when patients hold it because most of the times the patients will go like this and then they'll compress their chest up. So I'll hold it for them and I'll tell them shoot the air towards the paper, breathe in belly and chest expansion, and then breathing out. And they want to shoot it for as long as they can. Um, you'll have a lot of patients come in and they'll go, and you'll see their chest kind of just rise like that or just their belly. Um, so that's something that I have them practice at home, tape to their kitchen cabinet or a lamp, for example. And I tell them whenever you are walking past it, just do like two or three breaths and see if you can pattern that. I don't really like patients doing 30 minutes straight of breathing techniques because it's actually more about motor control, changing their normal breathing patterns to make it a part of their daily life. Because um, they can be really good at task orientation and stuff, and then all of a sudden they'll be doing their daily activities and their breathing pattern goes back to throat breathing or just shallow chest breathing. Fourth technique that I use is uh, straw breathing. Really easy. I tell patients don't get the plastic ones, try to get the metal reusable ones that you can wash. Um, but I'll at work, of course, we use disposable plastic ones. So I'll have patients break it up into three ways. They'll do inhalation only through the straw, and then they'll do exhalation only, and then they'll put it together, inhale, exhale. I do that because a lot of patients, when they put the straw in their mouth, there's a lot of res resistance and they get scared. They get scared because they don't feel like they're getting enough air in, they don't get enough air out, so we break it up nice and slow. I'll have patients do it sitting, and then standing. Standing is actually really hard for a lot of patients. So I call this kind of level one resistance with them and then I'll show you some devices later that we use for higher level resistance. I saw uh, there's a harmonica. I wanna check that out later. That was really cool guys. Um, okay, so basically with the straw, it's also helping decrease that throat breathing because we are focusing on lip pressure and making sure that they're shooting that air out. So you guys can definitely try that at home. Um, it's a great device. So the 
fifth breathing technique is ratio breathing. So this one's big for motor control. We are focusing on inhaling two counts in, four counts out, but this is actually really hard for patients when they try to do this with like walking or um, like reaching for things, uh, carrying a bag. So it's trying to get both here and here to expand two counts in. And then sometimes I have patients hold it and then exhale four counts out. Now what happens with this one a lot of times is patients will have this when they do the exhale, they'll go <clears throat> like that. I don't know if you guys heard that, but um, a lot of them brace with their throat muscles. They'll go <clears throat> like that. So that's something when they're trying to control this, I have them try to relax their throat muscles as much as possible so they're not tightening. And instead they just <clears throat> exhale like this. Um, so that's why. Now I give them a lot of different breathing techniques because usually when people go into panic mode um, and they're having a lot of shortness of breath, they'll choose one or two and they'll implement that for the time being. So these are some of the breathing devices that I work with patients using. We'll go over the inspirometer technique today, um, but acapella and aerobica are for mucus clearing. And then the breather is for resistance. Uh, that's like level three. As you can see, there's six levels for inhale uh, resistance patterns and then five for the exhalation patterns. So you can literally put that in your mouth and you can go and train your diaphragm that way. Um, the inspirometer, here we go. Oh, let me just go back. The breather I have patients um, get online. You can easy to get on Amazon. Inspirometer we give out and or they have an acute care stay in the hospital and they also get one. Um, acapella aerobica, sometimes the providers will provide it. Sometimes patients want it immediately and they also just kind of get that online. But I usually ask uh, patients to ask their doctors for one. Okay, so inspirometer techniques, um, pretty across the board uh, is pretty much the same. However, when patients come in, I notice that they do it a lot at home. But when they, I ask them to demo it for me, they'll sit in the chair like this and they'll hold the device like this. And so already they're locking up their chest. They're only getting expansion up here and it's not going that far. Second thing I see that patients do is they don't actually focus on the exhale. They'll focus so much on the inhale and then they'll go like this on the exhale. And I don't know if you guys saw that, but right here, right here. So patients will go and then they'll go. So nothing actually moves. But so what I have patients do is I have them sit at the edge of the chair, really good posture. And I have them put the device at chin height so they're not holding it like this and compressing their chest. I'll just have them hold the mouthpiece out far. And then I'll tell them to breathe in, take the mouthpiece out and then really forcefully exhale and have them get both belly and chest to <sighs> compress. You have to get the abdominal muscles moving because those abdominal muscles are gonna be pulling those ribs down, those lower ribs that attach to the diaphragm. And then their hip muscle or their hips can also come up. So you're getting full compression. And then I tell patients, yes, if possible, try to repeat five to 10 times every hour. That's really, really hard for a lot of patients. So I tell them if you're sitting down watching TV, just do a couple puffs and we'll see from there. Um, so energy conservation techniques that I go over with patients, um, basically the four P's, I really wanna say five P's, but number one, prioritize what needs to be done during the day. Choose the heaviest, most aggressive type of activity that you're gonna do and space it out, break it up. A lot of patients like to rush, rush, rush. The faster I get it done, the less action I have to use and the faster I get to go and do other things. And that's not really true. Uh, you're probably gonna use more oxygen because you're rushing through it and you're now like taking a lot of short breaths. Um, so pace yourself. This is not a race for your tasks. And then position, really, really good posture. So sitting at the edge of your chair, shoulders back, breathing with belly and chest and concentrating on that. And then also movement, 
throughout the day, the best posture is one that constantly changes, so we don't want to be sitting down for four hours in front of the computer watching YouTube or TV. Uh, we do want to be moving as much as we can. Um, we have this handout up at our booth, so if you guys want to check us out after and grab one, please do. But it's a variety of things for your daily activities and how to make it a little bit more energy, or to save um, on some energy. So now we can kind of get moving. Um, these are some seated exercises that I do with patients. I was going to add so much more, but then I was like, oh, we're going to probably run out of time. But I want everyone to like sit at the edge of their chair if you can. Feet flat on the floor. And we're going to concentrate and do that type of breathing that I was talking about earlier. So you're going to try and get your chest and your belly all the way down to your pubic bone, really, to fully expand. And the reason why I put the first one as neck muscle stretches is because a lot of patients breathe through here and it's very, very tight. So I have patients just kind of, well, if we can grab, you can grab the edge of your chair, you can lean over and really gently with like two fingers, pull your ear to your shoulder. And in this position, now you're going to take a super deep breath in, filling belly and chest, feel that expansion through your ribs. And then you're gonna exhale forcefully out and you're going to feel that compression of your ribs down. You should feel your abdominal muscles. Now, I have patients stay in this position for almost like a minute, literally. Uh, a lot of patients will hold and only do for about five seconds, and that's not quite enough because we're using these stretches to get thoracic mobilization. We're trying to get your spine to mobilize, your ribs, and to get the muscles to stretch out. And, of course, you always do it on both sides, even though one side might be tighter than the other and you take a nice deep breath in, get full expansion, and then forceful exhale, squeezing your core muscles. All right, so then we'll say a minute has passed. Um, <laughs> the next exercise that I have a lot of patients do, either with a foam roller or a towel behind their back, but I think these chairs will be great. You're gonna keep your feet flat on the floor, but you're gonna put your arms behind your head you're going to pull your elbows back and you're going to lean back. And now you're having a lot of stretch through the front part of your ribs. They're elevated now. When you inhale, you want them to lift up even more. Everything open. And then when you exhale, you want to use your core muscles to pull them down and squeeze those bottom lower parts of your ribs and shoot that air out. It might be pretty tight for some people, but that's what you want to do. You want to inhale and then exhale and get that type of action. <laughs> so a lot of people think, wow, after I do these, I feel like I did a thousand sit-ups. And I'm like, yes, that's actually true. <laughs> um, okay, so let's say we did that uh, 10 times. And then we're moving on to the next one. Uh, sorry, this picture over here, I forgot to add the arm motion, but seated side bending. You're either going to brace your hand on the chair or you can let it hang. I usually have patients brace so they don't fall off. Um, and then you're just going to bring your arm over your head and you're going to lean. And you want your whole entire side of your rib cage and your hip to open up. And then you're going to take three deep breaths. So you're going to inhale, expanding, feel that side opening up. And then you're going to exhale and you're going to use your muscles down here to pull your ribs down and squeeze. And then you're going to take a really big inhale. And then you're going to exhale and squeeze. And I do have patients hold this for about three breaths and then they switch over. And then they do that again on the other side. I think the cat cow actually will be quite difficult. So I might skip that, but I will show you. <laughs> in the seated position. Uh, let's not have anyone hit their heads. So basically, um, in the seated position, you are going to take a, lift your arms up above your head. You're gonna look up, and a lot of people miss this point. They don't drop their head back. They'll keep it straight forward, and they'll lift their head up like this. So I always recommend dropping your head back, totally relaxing it. And then in this position, you take a big deep inhale and then a deep exhale. A lot of people think, oh, I'm just going to inhale and like in yoga, inhale and then drop down and exhale. 
But you want to inhale, exhale at the top, expanding your ribs and then compressing them. And then you're going to reach down to your toes as far as you can go. And a lot of people also keep their head up in this position, but you actually want to drop and totally relax chin to chest, having these neck muscles back here. Um, relax. And then at the bottom, you're going to take a really deep inhale and exhale and let your body sink down even further. So those are some of the pretty basic exercises that I run through with patients. You're free to do these at home unless they're causing you pain. Um, but uh, yeah, the other things that we do at rehab, we do uh, myofascial release, I do scar tissue release, I do diaphragm release with patients. I teach them how to do that at home to increase their ability for um, thoracic expansion and lung movement. Uh, we also do a lot of strengthening exercises and what it comes down to with the strengthening exercises is a lot of motor control because patients, as soon as they start moving, they'll change their breathing pattern to something that is very short um, and or secondary breathing muscles and or throat breathing. So they can sit there and concentrate and do the perfect breathing technique and then as soon as they move, they're breathing like that again. And so it's a lot of retraining that subconscious brain to implement the right breathing techniques. Um, yeah, so in summary, we learned today how to measure heart rate oxygen and RPE while exercising, making sure that you measure it for two minutes after you stop exercising, because that's where you see the most fluctuation. Um, you want to perform three-dimensional breathing techniques uh, with both belly and chest expansion, not just one or the other. Then decrease your throat breathing. And if you have anyone who throat breathes, try to maybe tell them to come to PT and or see their doctor and change that as soon as possible. The longer you wait to change the throat breathing techniques, the harder it is to change, I think, down the road. It's still possible, but um, uh, I think it's, it takes a little bit more time because it's a big habit change. So we also learned how to perform multiple breathing techniques for strength, endurance, and motor control. And we use proper posturing for the inspirometer techniques by putting it at chin level so patients can control here and their chest instead of being compressed down. Uh, the sixth thing is utilizing energy conservation techniques with daily living activities. You can grab a sheet upstairs after this. And then we also perform some seated stretches with three-dimensional breathing techniques. And I think we are on to questions. Any questions? No? I'll give you more time. If there's any questions, feel free to ask. Um, but I do want to mention that at rehab, I'm the physical therapist there who does the pulmonary PT. And then we have a group exercise program, the pulmonary recovery circuit program. That's what I usually transition patients out to. It's a little bit higher level of like treadmill, bikes, stretches, uh, weighted exercises, stuff like that. And of course it's tailored to the patient. So if you know we have some patients who only do the new step while they're there for 30 minutes or so, um, and then they can take a break. And then also, on top of that, the, the sessions are about an hour each. And as of now, we got a grant. So the first 12 sessions for patients through the program are uh, covered. So, yeah. I just had a question about who all is in your pulmonary rehab team. Is it just you or are there respiratory therapists or other yeah. staff? Yeah. Um, so far, I am the only PT who is running and seeing the patients right now. We do have Abby, who is um, the head of the Rehab Strong programs. She runs the Pulmonary Rehab Recovery Circuit program. And then we have, under her, we have a few other um, rehab techs that help out with that program as well, monitoring patients and doing the exercises with them. Yeah. I wish we had RTs. That would be awesome. <laughs> I sort of know this answer, but I'm going to ask it just in case. Sure. <laughs> um, do you only get referrals from pulmonology clinics, or can you get referrals from, you know, any doctor or primary care doctor or provider? Yeah, I can get, I get referrals from a whole host of providers. It um, doesn't have to be a pulmonologist. Uh, you send patients and a ton of other uh, people send patients as well. So if you are a 
a primary care physician, you can also send it over. Usually we like to see pulmonary PT written if you want physical therapy. If you want the pulmonary recovery circuit class, we have patients just have their doctor write that down. It's more so that it's like a clearance letter for activity. I've had a patient come in once and technically wasn't cleared for physical activity. Uh, he came in because he heard about it. Super appreciative that he did, but he wanted to join the circuit class. And um, he just came back from like, or he was doing some type of home health care and he was satting at about 78%. So I was like, you're not quite ready for that, uh, but if you get a physical therapy and or just another home health care referral, that would be great. So it's just a, a safety clearance thing. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, oh do you? Are you guys doing any virtual pulmonary rehab? And if so, uh, what kind of, what does that look like? Unfortunately, we're not doing any type of virtual pulmonary rehab. Um, I wish potentially that we could have, but yeah, there's a lot of hands-on components actually with this type of rehab as well, especially when it comes to the uh, myofascial release and the scar tissue release and the diaphragm release that we do and teach the patients and teach the patient's partners how to do at home. So yeah. Anyone else have any questions? Mine's just kind of a, a practical question about the program because I'm learning as much as I can about it. And yeah. I'd like to make the best use of you guys. Um, for the circuit training piece of this, is there, do you guys supply the oxygen or do they have to bring a POC or how does that work? Uh, they usually bring in their own oxygen. So yeah. The patients bring that. Mm -hmm. And then um, are there any kind of like um, metrics, like let's say six minute walk mm -hmm. at the beginning of the program, at the end of the program, things like that? Yeah, we usually do the six minute walk test or a 10 meter walk test or a 30 second sit to stand if depending on their level. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Are you guys considering um, doing virtual pulmonary rehab as well, especially for our neighbor island and other folk? Yeah, and unfortunately right now we're not um, doing any virtual yet. I do have some patients off island that fly in every couple of weeks or so. Um, currently one of my patients on Maui, of course he hasn't been here in a, in a bit due to the circumstances, but he comes in a couple of weeks at a time and then we kind of go over some stuff. I'm gonna show my ignorance here a little bit, but, but um, you're probably the right person to ask this. And that is uh, a lot of patients ask um, about, you know, what, gee, doctor, what can I do to make my breathing better, stronger, work my muscles? And that kind of leads to the inspiratory muscle training devices. What's, I don't honestly know the literature supporting that. Can mm. you, do, are you, what's your take on those devices? Is it something that you recommend to patients? Is it something that you use? I know yeah. on your show, you used to show it a few on your slides. Yeah. Um, I do recommend those devices for patients, but I do think kind of like how you guys were talking about the inhalers, really demonstrate, like have the patients demonstrate it because a lot of them are sitting down in their chair doing it like this and it's not really benefiting them. They're only getting, they're getting their secondary breathing muscles really strong and they're not getting their primary breathing muscles to work as well. And so if I think if you're doing it correctly with the right breathing mechanics, it is great. It is a great device to help strengthen. Um, with a lot of patients who have COPD, the inspirometer, can be helpful, but I usually focus a lot on the exhale with them. They are very short with their exhale. And so getting a resistive device like the breather, for example, that does both inhale and exhale has been really helpful for them. Even the straw, just the basic use of the straw is helpful. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. If you guys have any questions, I'll be upstairs. With all those questions, I think we need to work on cloning, Erica. We just need to have more of you to do virtual, neighbor island, and also in person. So thank you for that really helpful talk. I think we all got a little bit deeper breathing while we were in here. I know that I did. And really helpful techniques and tips and ways to exercise and do it in a safe manner and measure some of those parameters that we might need to follow. 
I'm certainly hoping all my patients follow your advice. I think I need to follow your advice, work on deeper breathing. So now we have Dr. Eric Crawley. He's going to talk about advanced techniques and therapies in the treatment of severe COPD. He's the director of the Polymomy Medical Center's Lung Health Center and one of the busiest pulmonologists I know. So we are so lucky to have him here today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Crawley. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kozak. Thank you, Val, for inviting me to, to be part of this awesome emergence from uh, our two years or plus of uh, COVID isolation. It's nice to be back and see you all's faces. Um, so I'm going to talk about a topic which is a little bit um, narrow in the sense that it doesn't apply to most patients who have emphysema or COPD. It applies to a, a small subset, but it is important for our, us to be aware of it because if you do are someone who might qualify, it's, it's really worth knowing about. And uh, it's a, a, a relatively new FDA-approved intervention therapy called bronchoscopic lung volume reduction, and uh, which is offered in, here in Hawaii now. Um, just to kind of put out there the disclosures, I don't have any financial relationship with any of these companies or any type of in, uh, stock ownership or any entanglements there. Um, I, I love this picture. I stole it from the, uh, the COPD Foundation's website there. And, and I think it kind of really nicely shows really what we're looking for in the patients that are candidates for this. And that is, if you look at that, those two lungs, one lung is, is like a balloon that's overinflated and it's got that pressure valve on it. And it's kind of like a pool toy or, or something that you're sitting in. And that's exactly what we're looking for with patients for this procedure. And that is that they, they're the condition that we're addressing is hyperinflation. That means how too much air in your chest. So if your lungs are overfilled with air, there's really no space for more air to come in. And so you'll feel shorter breath and tight. It's kind of like what we're looking at is how do we pop that valve there and release some of that pressure in that tight lung to make space for air to come in and out. Um, now, so this concept of hyperinflation, so too much air in my lung, lungs are overinflated, um, it, it really re results in shortness of breath for a lot of reasons. One is that the diaphragms are, are flattened and you're not able to take as big a breath. So even when you're doing the breathing, the wonderful breathing exercise that you just learned about, it can be difficult because the lungs are already kind of overfilled. Um, and so how can we, you know, treating hyperinflation can improve symptoms. And so really, we think of what we standardly do in like bronchodilators or inhaled medicines, either through meter dose inhalers or dry powder inhalers or nebulizers, but medicines that open up the breathing tubes. And when I tell my patients, when I sit and talk to them about COPD, I say, think about your lung like it's a balloon, because it really is kind of like a balloon. And there's two things that are going on in, in emphysema. One is the, it's like you have a balloon that's overstretched out. So when you have a brand new balloon, you blow it up with air and you let go of it and it flies across the room really quickly and it empties quickly because it's very rubbery and it basically wants to recoil and close. But if someone has advanced emphysema, those lungs, it's kind of like a balloon that's older and more stretched out. And when you let go of it, it kind of empties, but it slowly empties because it's not quite as elastic as it used to be. And that's one concept of, of in, in emphysema or COPD. The other one is that the, uh, the, the nozzle of the balloon might be narrow. So if we think about it, if I have a balloon that has a really big opening and I let go of it, it empties quickly versus a very narrow opening, it's going to take a long time to empty. So that's kind of how our medicines work. So if we think about it, the bronchodilators, they're opening up the nozzle of the balloon so that the balloon can empty more quickly. And so, um, of course, those work really well in situations like asthma where you have breathing tubes that are tight and the muscles uh, and the medications relax those muscles. Then there's the breathing techniques we which you just talked about, which are incredibly important because what they allow you to do is give you more time to get air out. So again, if that balloon is kind of stretched out and takes a long time to get the air out, the more time you can spend getting air out, the more air actually exits your lungs, and then the more carbon dioxide exits your body, and the more fresh air you can take in, and the better you ventilate and the better you breathe. So that's obviously really important. And, and kind of along that vein, 
one of the things that happens to patients, if someone has a severe asthma or severe COPD attack and they end up in the hospital and they end up on a ventilator, a lot of times the reason that happens is because they panic, because they're short of breath and they're scared and their brain says, breathe fast. And actually when they breathe fast, they don't have enough time to get the air out, the bad air out. They fill up with air, their pressure in their chest increases, and it actually affects their heart function and things like that. So that learning how to meditate, slow your breathing down, going, I know I feel I'm short of breath, but let me work at getting that bad air out. So just giving an attaboy to the, the last lecturer. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, and then, um, then that brings me to uh, interventions that can reduce lung volume uh, through procedures. And that would be, how do I take lung that's overfilled and actually reduce the size of that lung through an, a procedure? And there's either, uh, can be done really one of two ways. It either can be done by surgery where you remove part of that lung that's overinflated, or it can be done with these little valves. And we'll talk about the valves today. So these are, and again, everything I put up here, there's gonna be some that are, that are corporate, you know, not corporate slides, but the pictures come from, from uh, various companies. Now, there currently are two different products that are FDA approved for this uh, disease. And I, I present both of them e in equal amount of slides, so there's not any favoritism towards any one product. Um, and I can say actually that the literature suggests that both products work basically equ equivalently. We don't think there's really one that's better than the other. Um, and they're both just really elegant. If you think about it from a design standpoint, if you look at the one on the left, the, the spiration valve by Olympus, it's a little upside down umbrella. It's kind of a neat little design. It's got little little uh, feet um, that, that kind of grab the airway, and it's got that little rod on the right-hand side that if you want to remove it, you can grab that and pull it out. And then on the right side, there's the Zephyr valve, which is kind of, a, we call that a duckbill valve, and it kind of has a little, little duckbill inside, and so the air can go one direction but not the other direction. And it's, it's seats, it's little struts kind of hold it in place. Um, and so these are our two, and they're both designed as one-way valves. So what they do is they let air out of the lung, but not into the lobe that's treated. So this would be a picture of hyperinflation in a practical sense. Here's an x-ray, a normal x-ray on the right, and an abnormal x-ray on the left. And the one on the left, what I want you to look at is a couple things. So as I push my little key here, the, the circle shows the upper lobes are very lucent. So I'm not sure how that, well that projects, but does, do you get the feeling that the upper part of those lungs are really black? And air is black. But in this case, if there's a lot of air and not a lot of lung tissue, it's gonna look more black than the normal side. So you can just see it's really dark and hyperinflated. So that's called, that's hyperinflation, overinflated lung. But then there's another thing I'm looking at on that x-ray and that's flattening of the diaphragm. So the diaphragm should be a nice dome. And again, and that dome, as it contracts, it helps me pull air in. But if that dome is already flattened out, it can't pull air in. And so that's what you see there at the arrow. The red arrow shows the flattening of the diaphragm, which tells me this person is too much air in their chest. It's pushing their diaphragm down, making it hard to breathe, versus the normal patient on the right with their diaphragms have nice curves to them. This is a lateral or side view x-ray. Kind of really also shows that flattening really, really well. On the left, you've got the abnormal patient that's almost straight. It's almost straight across, whereas on the right, it's more of a dome or it's kind of dome. And that's that flattening of the diaphragm. Now, early attempts at this to, to take care of this condition, and 30 years ago when I was a fellow, or 20 some odd years ago when I was a fellow, I was actually taking pig lungs and, and filling them up with glue and all kinds of tricks to try to figure out how to do this, because I thought this might work, but I wasn't smart enough to invent a little device. I wish I had, I'd, I'd be in Fiji right now. <laughs> but. Uh, but no, so initial attempts were surgical lung volume reduction. And so, and we still do this procedure. So in that case, someone would go to the operating room, very selected, very selected patient, and remove the bad lung, if you will, to make space with the good lung. But then again, that's permanent. You can't put the lung back in. Secondly, it's a surgery. So that comes with some recovery and some anesthetic risks. And it's not done in Hawaii. So you're gonna have to go to the mainland to have this done. And I have sent patients to the mainland for this and they've had very good outcomes. So for the right patient, it can be really a good decision. Um, so, but can we do this in a way that's a little less invasive and we're not having to put scars on people and we're not having to remove lung. And that's really where the valves come in. So there are two different landmark studies that were done. Each of these studies uh, by each of the two products that, that are out on the market were both very similar designs. They both did them very, very much the same way with kind of the same number of patients and the same kind of outcomes. 
And they both really showed similar, similar results. And that was that the FEV1, that's a number on the breathing test that we get that is a measure of severity of emphysema or asthma, the FEV1 improved. Now, it didn't improve in every patient, but it improved in greater than 15%, so a, over 15% improvement in around 50% of the patients or 47% of the patients. So not everybody got better, but those who did, it was a pretty significant improvement. Um, they also showed reduction in hyperinflation. So when they looked at the amount of air in the lungs, it was less, which was the goal. People had improved shortness of breath, and that was based on some questionnaires that they would fill out. They also had an improved six-minute walk distance. They could walk farther in six minutes. And lastly, they had improved quality of life scores. So basically, questionnaires that ask, how does COPD affect your life? Is your quality of life better? And they showed a significant improvement there. Interestingly, out of uh, the Dutch recently uh, did a, a study that just came out looking at um, uh, survival in patients that, that received lung volume reduction versus those that did not. Uh, and actually, the, they showed a 1.7-year survival benefit. I think that that is a little, um, un, it remains to be seen if that's a true, uh, a true association or not, but at least it tells us that we're not seeing anything that suggests that patients do worse with this procedure, and, and maybe they might actually have a survival benefit. But I don't, don't tell people that expect that. Now, this is actually a real patient. It's a Hawaii patient, the first one I did, and did this one back, actually, I, I sat for like two years with this patient waiting for these to get approved by the FDA, and when they got approved, I said, okay, you're the guy, let's do this thing. Uh, because he was very symptomatic. This was a, a gentleman who was a, uh, had, a history, had COPD and emphysema. He was a really avid snowboarder and really, really desperately wanted to get back on the slopes and just really couldn't because of his shortness of breath. And he was on great therapy. He was doing everything right. And so we, we looked at his imaging. And the reason I wanted to do his case was because when I looked at his imaging, I said, wow, something looks different on this scan. So if you look at his two, so the CT scan on the right, and again, I'm not sure well, how, how well it projects, but in the um, right side of the CT, the, the, the left panel, the left picture on the right side of the, of the left picture, the bottom part is very black. Again, we talked about how if it's really dark and black, it's a lot of air there. And there's not a lot of white and lines, which is the blood vessels. So that tells me that that part of that lung has got lots of air in it, but doesn't have a lot of blood supply. So it's probably not doing much good for this patient. And it's probably not really helping him breathe. And it's taking up space. And you can see on the other picture, the diaphragm, again, is very flattened. And, and so this would be uh, an example of a report. So what we do is when we're assessing patients for this, we get a CT scan, and it has to be done a specific way, which we'll talk about. And then that CT scan is then uploaded to a mainland, to a portal online. So it's de-identified. We take off all the patient's data. We upload that to an uh, online portal. And then uh, radiologists and some computer software analyzes that scan and then gives us back a report. And what we're looking for in this report is really three things. We want to see, first of all, that there's a lot of emphysema in one of the lobes. So in this case, the bottom right, the darker the color, the more emphysema there is. Second thing we want to see is that the lobe next to it has less emphysema, meaning that you've got one bad one next to a decent one. And then the third part is, is the fissure or the separation between the lungs intact? Because that, and that's the gray line we see on the right between them. And what that tells me is, because if that fissure is not intact, the procedure won't work because air will just go right across that fissure, and even though I put the valves in, the lung won't deflate, that lobe won't deflate. So we look for this, he helps us get some objective data that say, yeah, this guy's a good candidate. Um, so in this case, this patient had a very typical outcome, and what I mean by that is he, he developed uh, an anticipated complication that typically happens uh, in about 30% of patients. So typically we think about complications as a bad thing, like, oh gosh, that something bad happened to our patient. The really weird part about this is, is this is something that's pretty expected in about 30% of patients, but it actually predicts that they're going to do well because the reason they get this collapsed lung is because it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. It's shrinking that bad lung, and then the bigger uh, lobe next to it is increasing, and sometimes as that stretches and increases, a little hole opens up. And, and so usually this is not a life-threatening problem. We, we, uh, we anticipate it and we put a small little tube in between the ribs to inflate the lung and keep it in that tube until the lung heals on its own. And so he was in the hospital for six days, and then he went home, and has subsequently done well. And his breathing tests have improved significantly. So that FEV1 number, which was 0.78 liters, which is very low, about 30% are predicted, 
went up to over a liter and to 1.1 liters or 48, 4%. And that's actually a pretty dramatic improvement. I actually did a patient uh, about two or three weeks ago, or a couple weeks ago now, and I repeated his breathing test and I actually called up my, my PFT tech and I said, is this, did you mess up? Is this the wrong patient? Because there's no way this is the same guy. And it was mind bogglingly better, his PFTs, I couldn't believe it. Um, so it can be pretty exciting. So, so what, are we, what does a good candidate look like? So if we're trying to find the right person for this procedure, well, first of all, they can't be like, in a, if, they're, if they're super weak and debilitated, like they're in a wheelchair or they can't walk but a few feet, that's not really a good candidate for this procedure because they're going to be going, they have to be able to rehab and they have, and they have to be able to tolerate the anesthesia. Uh, can't be smoking, so at least off for four months, okay, at least four months of the abstinence. Um, you got to be able to tolerate general anesthesia because that's how we place the valves. Um, you have to be symptomatic, right? So, not, you know, if you're like, oh, I just got a little bit of shortness of breath. Well, that's not somebody we want to do this. And we want someone who says, look, doc, I'm, a, I'm doing everything right. I'm on my medicines, and I'm still short of breath, and my quality of life is not what I want it to be, and I, I'm willing to take this risk and take a procedure. And so that's the, you, you need to be symptomatic. And then the CT scan we talked about, you want to see intact fissures, and you want to see a lot of emphysema because that's what we're trying to fix. And then on the breathing test, there needs to be hyperinflation. This is really critical. It doesn't work if you're not hyperinflated because that's how it works. So we're looking for that residual volume, which is how much air is left over in the chest after you blow out to be very high. Um, what are some things that are not good candidates? Well, first of all, if you have lots of mucus. So if someone has chronic bronchitis and they've got tons and tons of phlegm, that's not a very good candidate because we're putting these little valves in and they may be at higher risk of pneumonia because we're, you know, because the phlegm might build up beyond that valve. If you're too sick to tolerate anesthesia, you can't walk, your oxygen requirements are pretty high, more than about three liters, um, or if you have a lung nodule that could possibly be a cancer, we don't want to do this because we won't be able, to, if, if there's a nodule in that lobe we treat, we won't be able to follow that on CAT scan because it's going to no longer have air in that lobe and we won't be able to see if it's growing or not. So for that reason, we don't do it in that population either. Um, we talked a little about the risks. So what are the risks? Well, the most significant risk is a pneumothorax. That's, that just means a collapse of lung. But as I told you, it's about 27% of the time that happens. But that actually is not necessarily a bad thing. It's something that says this, this actually is probably going to work for you. It's unfortunate that you, have to have, that you may have to have a small chest tube put in, but it's not the end of the world. Um, and it's not like it's a technical thing like we did it wrong. It's just this is how the lung reacted to replacing these valves. Um, increases the risk of COPD and pneumonia. There's a small increased risk of that after the procedure, uh, uh, tube exacerbation. Um, sometimes patients need another bronchoscopy to adjust a valve or remove a valve. Um, in the studies, there was actually four deaths in one of the studies. And what they realized, the four patients that died all died at home from collapsed lungs within about 72 hours of the procedure. So initially, these patients were being watched for 24 hours. And then what we realized, they realized, the researchers said, you know, if we keep them in the hospital for three days, we would have identified these before they went home. So for that reason, patients have to spend uh, three days in the hospital, two, two to three days in the hospital after the procedure. And then of course, there's always that lack of benefit. Not everybody's gonna get a benefit. Um, so how do I figure out if someone's a candidate? Well, we do some breathing tests. Now, the good news is all of you who have COPD should have breathing tests anyway. So this is not something extra that you're having to do. It's just something that should be part of your standard baseline evaluation. Um, again, if someone looks like they may be a candidate, we'll do a blood gas to measure their carbon dioxide level and oxygen level in their blood. Um, and they get a CT of their, of their chest. And many of the patients that qualify for this are getting a CT anyway because hopefully we're doing lung cancer screening if they qualify. Um, and then there's some other scans like a perfusion scan which looks at blood supply to the lung, a six minute walk where you see how far can you walk in six minutes and how much oxygen do you need. And then uh, sometimes they get an echocardiogram to look at the heart and make sure the heart's okay for the procedure. Um, now we don't want a patient to go through all that testing if they're not a candidate. We don't want them to have the cost and the inconvenience and all that. So easiest way to proceed is just to start off with the normal test we do, which is the breathing test, the spirometry. And if the patient looks like they have an acceptable lung function, we do with that body box, the patient's inside a little box there, and we measure their total lung capacity and the residual volume and their diffusion capacity. So we do some extensive breathing tests. If those tests 
don't show hyperinflation, then we know the patient's not a candidate and there's no point in putting them through the rest of the testing. But if they do have hyperinflation, we say, okay, now maybe this is a candidate. Let's go ahead and get the CT scan. Let's have the CT scan analyzed uh, for, uh, on the mainland. And then, and then from there, we can decide if this is something the patient wants to pursue, do we do all the other testing that's involved? And if they're not a candidate, because the, then that's okay too, because again, most people won't be candidates. Um, we focus on just making sure we're doing the best we can with their medications and pulmonary rehabilitation. And in some patients, we might talk about surgical lung volume reduction if that was a candidate option. Actually, they, if they don't qualify for lung bronchoscopic, they wouldn't qualify for surgery either. But the other option is transplant, which oftentimes we forget about and can be really a, a life-saving and, and, and incredibly uh, wonderful uh, opportunity for some patients. Um, what is it like for the patient? So we put the procedures in under a general anesthesia. So patient comes in, they go to the operating room and they go to under general. We put a, a breathing tube in to place them. And the valve insertion part is really, really pretty easy. Um, depending on which device we use, sometimes we use a catheter called the Chartist system, and that helps us figure out if there's any airflow between the lobes. It's a little balloon we put up to measure that. Then we place the valves. It takes about maybe 15, 20 minutes. Patient then wakes up, and they go to the, I, I, they're admitted to the hospital for three days is what I admit them for. Um, and because we know there's about a 27% chance the lung might collapse, we have all the materials we need at their bedside in case we have to do that so we don't go looking for those supplies. We have everything ready to go. And then after the, the 30, 72 hours of observation, they go home. And uh, six weeks later, we, we, we want to go ahead and repeat t testing. So we like to repeat their breathing tests and repeat a CT scan. And that's really to show that the, the procedure worked for them and also to see if there's any issues with valve placements. Do we need to move a valve or anything like that? Now, these are, these are the, my last slide here is just really questions. So these are common questions that might come up from a patient. They might say, hey, does everybody get better? Well, I already said not everybody benefits. It's probably about a 50-50 benefit rate is what I would estimate. I think it's a little higher than that if we pick the right patients, but, it, but it, not everyone's going to have a benefit. Is this covered by insurance? And, and it is. It's covered by Medicare, covered by Medicaid, and, and most, uh, many commercial insurers are now covering this, so that's good news. Um, what happens if I don't benefit? Well, we can remove them. And that's one of the beauties of this versus surgical lung volume reduction is I can't put a piece of lung back in that I cut out, right? In this case, we can go in, remove the valves, and say, well, we tried. It didn't work. Let's take them out. Um, how long do they stay in? So patients often ask, well, gosh, am I going to have this thing in my body forever? And, and the answer is yes, because they're designed to stay in forever. Um, uh, sometimes we'll take them out if there's a, some type of man, you know, malfunction in something or something like that. But, so they can be removed very easily and replaced, but normally they just stay in. And then um, last question is, again, how do I get evaluated? Well, you bring it up with your, with your physician, mention it. And, and most patients that would be candidates for this probably have a pulmonologist already or, or someone who's managing, an internal medicine doctor managing them. And, and, and so you can bring that up and say, you know, I wanna, I'm wondering if I'm a candidate for this. And they can certainly... Uh, refer for refer you to a, a provider who can do this procedure for evaluation, um, you know. And uh, as far as you know, finding people in Hawaii that do this, I think it's going to we're going to see a, a more more providers doing this, more systems doing this. I think in the very near future. Uh, currently, uh, um, myself and Dr. Evans, I think, are the two providers doing it on, on Oahu. Um, but again, I expect to see uh, people from Kaiser and Queens also start to, to be doing this in the near future. Um, and that's pretty much, uh, pretty much the story. So I just wanted to kind of share something interesting and new and, and open it up for questions. So there are some people attending um, the Zoom asking some questions. Um, they're asking if they're going to have an opportunity to get the handouts on different breathing techniques, as well as if they're going to be able to access um, all the slides that have been presented today. So it's going to be on the uh, uh, Valerie Chang just said she, uh, they'll put it on the website for those on the Zoom. The HawaiiCOPD.org. Great. All right. I guess that's it for questions, huh? Oh, I do have a question. Okay. Thank you. I've actually had patients ask me about this. Um, mm -hmm. If they want more information, where should I send them? Um, so they, so what, there's actually some uh, 
online materials for both companies. So if they were to look up online um, uh, either um, Spiration or which is one of the companies, the other one's Zephyr. Uh, both uh, both companies have a lot of patient information online. They also have little physician search functions, so you can search for a provider who does the procedure. Um, and and again, um, it's a new thing, so a lot of physicians aren't going to know who's the right candidates. So, I at least for I, I'm always open to, you know, if a doctor wants to reach out to me and say, hey, I've got this patient, are they an okay candidate? Usually, in about 30 seconds, we can get enough information to figure out if they're clearly not a candidate. Um, and if that's the, because oftentimes what happens is I get a call and the patient's so, so sick that they're really hoping for something and they're just a little too sick for the procedure. And we can figure that out very quickly. But um, yeah, I would think uh, online uh, access is probably a good way to go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I guess I have a question about um, the blood gas that you would draw mm -hmm. for the determination of the patient. Like sometimes we have patients on their oxygen, mm -hmm. if we take them off their oxygen, they're going to really work hard and blow down the CO2. So mm -hmm. like, should this initial blood gas evaluation be done on oxygen in these patients? Or do you want to room air blood gas? Where they might be I, I, breathing I, heavier I, and blowing that CO2 down. Ideally, uh, ideally room air if we can, because they're looking at a room air PO2 of less than 40, I think is what the cutoff was. But, um, but again, that's a good point. Um, if someone's on, you know, uh, you know, I think that the main thing is really the CO2. We're really focused on the carbon dioxide level because we want to know, can they tolerate this procedure? Um, so ideally a room air gas, but if they can't tolerate room air gas, I think you can get one on oxygen and still be of value. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, thanks again to Dr. Crawley. That was really interesting, exciting new techniques and therapies. It's always good to know that there's a lot of research going on in the field, and we're going to be able to offer patients even more as time goes on. All right, thanks again to everybody who has been here today. Now, if you're hungry, there's some food out there. But before you go, and I keep doing something up here, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll try and make it go away. Before you go, there is an evaluation that we want everybody to do. For those who joined us online, for those who are here in person, this really helps us to find out what type of speakers and what type of information you want to have going forward. So please, please, please fill those out. We appreciate it. And again, thanks to everybody for coming today and being here, Val, you wanted to say a few words? Yeah, can, whoops, sorry. Can we please give Dr. Kathleen Kozak a big round of applause? And I'd like to thank all our speakers, Dr. Eric Crowley, Erica uh, Saito, no, Erica Saito, okay. Um, uh, how do you pronounce Maya's first name? Maya, Maya um, Alba and uh, Pam McMillan. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank all the supporters who made this event possible, our exhibitors listed on the program, and all the 40 plus people on Zoom. That's why some of us are scared of being out in public still. So. We're glad you could participate via Zoom. Um, thank you especially for our platinum sponsor, HMSA in Queens, uh, Kapiolani Community College Respiratory Therapy Program, yay students. Um, Braun sponsors uh, Inspire Medical and Verona Pharma, and also all our exhibitors. And please, as um, Kathy said, please return your forms completed and pick up food and feel free to go and visit the exhibitors again and see whatever you might have missed. Thank you again so much. Look forward to seeing you guys in 2024, September. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>